Hello everyone, welcome to a special CUBE conversation here at the SiliconANGLE Media CUBE and Wikibon studio in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media Inc. I'm here with Peter Burst, head of research for a special Amazon Web Services reInvent preview. We just had a, a great uh, session with Peter's uh, weekly action item table, round table meeting with analysts around the trends. So that'll be up on, on YouTube, check that out. Really in depth conversation around what to expect at Amazon Web Services reInvent coming up in about a week and a half and also great content in there. But I want to go uh, here, Peter, have a conversation with you uh, back and forth because we've been having a debate, uh, ping ponging back and forth around what we think might happen. We certainly have some visibility in some of the news that might be happening at reInvent. But you guys have been doing a great job with the research. I want to get your thoughts and I want to just have a conversation around Amazon Web Services, continuing to kick ass. They've had a run you know, on their own for many, many years now, but they got competition. The, the visibility on Wall Street is clear. They know the profitability, the numbers are all taking shape. Microsoft stocks up from 26 to wherever it is now. It's clear the cloud is the game. That's what's going on. And you have, again, the top three, Amazon, Azure, Google, and then you, know, you can argue four through seven including Alibaba and others, big game going on. This is causing a lot of opportunities, but disruption to business models, technology architectures, and ultimately how customers are going to deploy their IT and or their digital business. Your thoughts. I think one of the most interesting things about this, John, is that in the first 10 years of the cloud, it was implied that it was a cost play. Don't do IT anymore, it's blah, 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 blah. Do the cloud, do AWS. And I think that because the competition is so real now, and a lot of businesses are starting to realize what actually could be done if you're able to use your data in new and yep. different ways and dramatically accelerate and transform your businesses, that all this has become a value play. And the minute that it becomes a value play, in other words, new types of work, new types of capabilities, then for Amazon, for AWS, it becomes an ecosystem play. Yeah. So I think one of the things that's most interesting about this reInvent is it's from my opinion, it's going to be the first one where it's truly a strong ecosystem story. It's about how Amazon is providing services that the rest of the world is going to yeah. be able to consume and create new types of value yeah. through the Amazon ecosystem. Great point. I want to um, bring up a topic that we've been talking on theCUBE and some like the other CUBE conversations as it relates to the ecosystem is in all these major ways, and we've seen many, you've covered many ways as, as an analyst over the years, there's always been a gestation period between a disruptive enabler. You could talk about TCP IP, you could talk about HTTP. There's always a, a period of gestation Sometimes it's accelerated now more than ever, but you start to see the impact of that disruptive enabler. Certainly cloud and what Amazon has done has been a disruptive enabler. Value's been created, more value's being created, more and more every day we're seeing it. You're starting to see new things pop up from this gestation period. Problems that become opportunities. Uh, and competitors that are now partners. Partners that are now competitors. So a full changeover is happening in the landscape because of it. So the question for you is, what are you seeing, given your experience of seeing other ways before, what is starting to be clear in terms of visibility that, that are becoming known points of obvious uh, straight and narrow trends that are happening with this cloud enabling? Well, let's talk about perhaps one of the biggest differences between traditional IT and cloud-oriented IT. Uh, and it, to kind of tell that story, I'll do something that a lot of people don't think about when they think about innovation. But if you really think about innovation, you got to break it down into two distinct acts. There's the act of inventing, which is an engineering act. It's how do I take knowledge of physics or knowledge of sociology or knowledge of something and invent something new that reflects my understanding of the problem and creating a solution. And then there's an innovation act, which is always a social act. It's getting people to change the way they do things, businesses to change the way they do things. That's a social act. And one of the interesting things about the transition, this transition, this cloud-based transition, is we're moving into a world where the social acts are much more synonymous with the actual engineering act. And by that I mean, when the something is positioned as a service that the customer gets and just acts on it because they're now renting a service, that is truly an innovation process. Yeah. You are adopting it as a service and embedding it more quickly. Yeah. So the what we're seeing now in many respects, going back to your core point, is everything being done as a service, it means that the binding of the inventing and the innovating is much more strong and much more immediate. Yeah. And, and AWS, yeah. you know, reInvent's been a form where we see this. It's not just inventing or putting forward a new product that may get out to market in six months or nine months. It is, here's a service, 
people are consuming it, we're embedding it in our other AWS stuff, we're, you know, we're yeah. putting this, this, uh, yeah. this AI into how folks yeah. are going to manage that's AWS, and the invention innovation process collapses. So yeah, I mean, I would, that's a good point, I would just uh, give you some validation on that by seeing other trend points that talk about that social piece. You hear about social engineering in cybersecurity but that's now a big part of how hackers are getting in through social engineering. Open source software is a social engineering exercise because it's got a community dynamic. Uh, blockchain, huge social engineering around how these companies are forming. So I would 100% agree that's a great, great point. The other thing I'd ask you to, to elaborate on is something that uh, is a trend that's obvious, is that there's a, and because everyone talks about the old way, new way, legacy is being disrupted, new players like Amazon are disrupting people like Oracle, and Oracle thinks they're winning, Amazon thinks they're winning. The scoreboards aren't the same, but it, here's the question. Technology used to be built to solve technology problems. You build a box, you ship it, and it works. Software, craft it, ship it, it does work or it doesn't work. Now software and technology are being used to solve non-technology problems. This brings it to a whole other level when you take your social comment and invention. This is now a new dynamic that tend to be, was, I don't want to say minimized in the old, way, old days, but the old days was, Load some boxes, rack it up, and you got a PC on your desk. We could work effectively on a network. So our now system, it's completely going non-technology problems, healthcare, you know, verticals. Well, here's the way we look What's at your it, thoughts John? on that? Our simple bromide is that we are in the midst of the transition in computing. And by that I mean, for the first 50 years we talked about known process, unknown technology. By that I mean, for example, have, we, have you ever seen a uh, have you ever seen a gap accounting uh, convention wandering out in the wild? No, it doesn't exist. It's man-made, it's artifice. There's nothing wrong with it. We all agree what an accounting thing is, but it's all highly stylized and extremely well-defined. It's a known process. And the first 50 years were about taking those known processes in accounting and in HR and a lot of other domains, yeah. and then saying, okay, what's the right technology to automate as much of this as possible? And we did a phenomenal job of it. Started with mainframes and client server, and was it this server or that server, Unix or something else, TCP IP or some other network. But that was the first 50 years of computing. Now we've got a lot of those things out. In fact, cloud kind of summarizes and puts forward a common set of experiences. Still a lot of technology questions yeah. that are going to be important. I don't want to suggest that that's not important, but Increasingly, it's, okay, what are the processes that we're going to try to automate? So it's, we're now in a world where the technology is much more known, but the processes are incredibly unknown. So, All right, so what does that impact to the cloud players like Amazon? Because they're, what I'm trying to figure out is, what will be the posture on the keynotes? Is it going to be a speeds and feeds show, or is it going to be much more holistic uh, business impact or societal impact? The obvious one is that Amazon increasingly has to be able to render these common building blocks for infrastructure up through to developers and a new way of thinking about how do you solve problems. And so a lot more of what we're likely to see this year is Amazon continuing to move up the stack and say, here's how you're going to look at a problem, here's how you're going to solve the problem, here's the tooling, and here's the ecosystem that we're going to bring along with us. So it's much more problem solving at the value level, going back yeah. to what we talked about earlier, problem solving that creates new types of business value as opposed to problem solving to reduce the cost of existing infrastructure. And we have a VIP chat on crowdchat.net slash ADIP is reInvent. If you want to participate, we got to open it. We're going to keep it open for a long time, weigh in on that. Um, we just had a great research meeting called, uh, that you do weekly called Action Item, which is um, a format that's designed to flesh out the latest and greatest research that's tied to current events or trends, and then you know, unpack the, the action item for uh, buyers and customers, uh, large businesses in, in the industry. Uh, what's the summary for the meeting we just had here? We had a lot of stuff being talked about, Unigrid, we're talking about under the hood with data, a lot of good stuff. What's the bottom line? How do you up level it for the, the CIO or CXO that's watching or listening, doesn't have time to get in the weeds? What's well, I think the three fundamental conclusions that we reach this year is that we expect uh, AWS to spend a lot of time talking about AI. Uh, both as a way of generalized way of moving up the stack as we talked about. Here's the services the developers are going to work with, here's the toolkits that they're going to utilize, et cetera, to solve more general problems, but also AI being embedded more deeply within AWS 
and how it runs as a service and how it integrates and work with, works with other clouds. So AI, machine learning for IT operations management through AWS. So AI is going to be a major feature. The second one we think that we're going to hear a lot about is Amazon's been putting forward this notion that my, they were going to facilitate migration of legacy applications into AWS. That's been a slog. But we expect to see even more, uh, or a more uh, focused effort by going after uh, specific big software houses that have large installed bases of on-premise stuff and see if they can't, with the software house, bring more of that infrastructure, more of those installations into AWS. Now, I don't want to call VMware an application house, but not unlike what they did with yeah. the VMware about a year and a half ago. And the last one is that we don't think that Amazon is going to put forward a general purpose IOT edge solution this year. We think that they're going to reveal further what their approach to those problems are, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know, bigger networks, more pops. More scale. More scale, yeah. uh, a lot of additional services for building applications that operate within that framework, uh, but not that kind of, here's what the hybrid cloud by Amazon is going to look like. Let's talk about competition and China. Obviously, they kind of go hand in hand. Obviously, Andy Jassy and the Amazon Web Services team are seeing for the first time massive competition. Obviously, Microsoft stocks, like I mentioned earlier. So you start to see the competition wheels cranking. Oracle's certainly been all over Amazon, we know that. Microsoft's just up in their game, trying to catch up, and their numbers are looking good. You got SAP playing the multi-cloud game. You got Google differentiating on things like you know, TensorFlow and other AI and kind of developer tools. This is interesting, this is the first time Amazon's really had some competition. I won't say nipping at its heels, but you know, putting pressure. It's not the one game in town. People talking multi-cloud, that's kind of talking about lock-in. And then you get the China situation. You got Alibaba, technically the number four cloud by some standards, uh, some will argue you know, that, that position. Oh, but I don't the, think the, the point is it's massive. Yeah, I, think it's, I don't think it's by, I think it's by any reasonable standard. They are a big cloud player. So let's go through that. Uh, China, let's start with China. Amazon just announced, and the news was uh, broken by the Wall Street Journal, who actually got it wrong and didn't correct the story for about uh, 20, almost 24 hours. Um, really kind of screwed up the market and thought that they were selling uh, uh, AWS to China. It was a unique deal. Rob Hof and the team reported and corrected. At SiliconANGLE. At SiliconANGLE.com that it got it, we got it right. And that is, is that it was a $300 million data center deal, not intellectual property, but this is the so China they sold playbook. their physical assets. Yeah. They didn't sell their IP, they didn't sell the services or the ability to provide the services. Yeah. Based upon my reporting, and this is again, still facts on the ground are loose because China's not, uh, it's hard to get the data, but from what I can gather, they're already doing business in China. Apple went through this, even though they're hardware, they still have software, everyone has that standoff, but ultimately getting into China is, requires a government-owned partner or a Chinese company, not government-owned, it's quasi, you can argue that. And then they expand from there. Apple now has, I think, six stores or more in Shanghai and all over China. So this is a growth opportunity for, for Amazon, if they play it right. Um, thoughts on that? And obviously we cover a lot of the Chinese companies here. Well, I don't want to present myself as an expert on this, John. I've been watching what's been, what the Silicon Valley angle reporting as the prime, has been my primary information source. Um, but I think that it's, it's interesting. We, we talk about hard assets and soft assets. Hard assets are buildings, machines, and in the IT world, it's the hardware, it's the building, et cetera. Uh, and when China talks about ownership, they talk about ownership of those assets. And I think it sounds to me anyway, like AWS has done a very interesting thing, where they said, okay, fine, you want 51% mm -hmm. of the hard assets? Have 51% of the hard, have 100% of the hard assets. But we are going to decide what those assets look like, and we are going to continue to try to control, to, to own and operate the software that runs on those assets. So it's, I, it sounds like, through that, yeah. they're going to provide a service into China, whatever the underlying hardware assets are running on. Interesting play. Well, we get the story right, and the story is, they're going into China and they had to cut a deal. That's it, that's the but story. for the hard assets. For the hard assets, they didn't get actual property. So it's a, I think it's a good deal for Amazon. We'll see, we're going to watch that closely. I'm going to ask Andy Jesse that specific question. Now on the competition. The FUD is off the charts. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You see that in competitive markets. The competition throw in FUD. Sometimes it's really blatantly obvious FUD. Sometimes it's just how they report numbers. I mean, I've been 
uh, not critical, but pointing out that uh, Azure includes Office 365. Well, when you start getting down that road, you bundle in the Salesforce a cloud player. So, you know, all these yeah. things start, to, of course. So what is, what is true cloud? Are people parsing the categories too narrowly in your opinion? What's the opinion from the research team on, on what is cloud? Well, what is, what is cloud? We like to talk about the cloud experience where the data demands for your business. So the cloud experience is basically, uh, it's, uh, it's a self-provisioning, it's a service, it is continuous, uh, and it allows you a range of different options about how, what assets yeah. you do or do not want to own. According to the, real, the physical realities, the legal realities and intellectual property realities of the data that runs your business. Okay. So that's kind of what we yeah. mean by cloud. Um, so let's let's talk about a couple of these. First, Hold on, before you get to the question, Andy Jassy said a couple of years ago, he believes all enterprises will move to the cloud. <laughs> I mean, he was kind of, of course, he's buying 100% Amazon, and Amazon is defined as cloud. But he's kind of referring to that the enterprise on-premise current business model and the associated technology will move to cloud. Now, I'm not sure he would agree that the true private cloud is the same as Amazon, but if he cuts a deal with VMware, like he did, that's, is that AWS? So, will his prediction come true? I mean, ultimately, everyone's saying it'll never be full cloud. I think it's, I think, this is one of, the, this is one of those things where we, we got to be a little bit careful about trying to read too much into what he said, but here's what we think. We, we, our advice to customers is don't think about moving your enterprise to the cloud, think about moving the cloud to your enterprise. And I think that's the whole basis for the hybrid cloud conversation that we're yeah. having. And the reason why we say the cloud experience where your data demands is that there are physical realities that every enterprise is going to have to deal with. Latency, bandwidth, there are legal realities yeah. that every enterprise is going to have to deal with. GDPR, what it means to handle privacy and handle data. And then there's finally intellectual property realities that every enterprise is yeah. going to have to deal with. Amazon not wanting to sell its IP to a Chinese partner yeah. to comply with Chinese laws. Every business yeah. faces these issues and they're not going to go away and that's what's going to shape every business's configuration yeah. of how they're using the cloud. And by the way, when I did ask that question, it might have been three years ago, I can't actually can't remember, I'm losing my mind here, but at that time, cloud was not yet endorsed as the viable way. So I mean, he might have been referring to, again, I'm going to ask him this when I, when I see him in my one-on-one, -on -one. he might have been referring to old enterprise ways. Yeah, you know, so look, I mean, look, let's be honest. Amazon has done such an incredible job of making this a real thing, uh, and, <laughs> and 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 our opinion is that they're going to continue to grow as fast as the cloud industry. However, we define it. What we tend to define, we think that SaaS is going to be a big player and it's going to be the biggest part of the player. We think infrastructure as a service is going to be continue to be critically important. We think that the that the uh, the competition for developers is going to heat up in a big way. AI, machine learning, deep learning, all of those things are going to be part of that competition. In our view of things, we're going to see SaaS be much bigger in a few years. We're going to see this notion of true private cloud, mm -hmm. which, is tr which is a cloud experience on premise uh, with your assets because yeah. you need to control your data in different ways is going to be bigger than IAAS, but it's all going yeah. to be cloud. I mean, at all points, my opinion and what I'm looking for this year, Peter, just to kind of wrap up the segment is, I think, and if you look at Amazon's new ad campaign, The Builders, that's a, a topic that we talked about last Developers. year. Developers. Developers. We are living in a world where DevOps is now going mainstream and there are still cultural issues around what does that actually mean for a business. Um, the personnel, how they operate, and some of the things you guys point out in your True Private Cloud report illuminates those things. And that is, whoever can automate and create great tooling for the DevOps culture going forward, whatever that's called, developer, new developers, new normal, whatever it is, that to me is going to be the competitive landscape. So, so let, me, let, me, let me take it, let me, let me parse that slightly or put it slightly differently. I think everybody put forward this concept of DevOps as, hey, business, redefine yourself around DevOps, and it hasn't gone as well as a lot of people thought it would. I think, what you're, I think what's really going to happen, I don't think you disagree with me, John, is that we need to bring more developers into cloud, building that cloud experience, building more of the application value, building more of the enterprise value, in cloud. Now that's happening, yeah. and they are going to start yeah. snapping this DevOps concept into place. But I think yeah. it really is going to boil yeah. down to how our developer is going to fully embrace the cloud, what's yeah. it going to look like. It's going to be multi-cloud. Let's go back to the competition. Microsoft, you're right, but they're a big SaaS player. Companies are building enormous relations, you know, big contracts with Microsoft. They're going to be there. Uh, Google, 
Last year was a, they couldn't get out of their own way. Diane Green comes in, we see a much more focused yeah. effort. There's some real engineering that's going on for Google Cloud Services that, or you know, platform that wasn't there before. Google is emerging as a big yeah. player. We're having a lot of conversations with users where they're taking Google very seriously. IBM is still out there, still got some things going on. You've already mentioned Alibaba, Tencent, a whole bunch of other players in the globe. Yeah. This is this is going to be a yeah. market that's going to be very, very contentious, but Amazon's going to get yeah. their fair and share. And I think we pointed out years ago that DevOps will merge to cloud developers. You nailed it. I think you just said it. Okay, Peter Burris here for the Amazon Web Service Preview. Of course, theCUBE will be there with two sets. We're going to have over 75 interviews over the course of three days uh, in the hall. Look for theCUBE if you watch this video and you want to come by. If, if, you're, if you've got a ticket, it's sold out, but if, come by if you have a ticket. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be there in Las Vegas for Amazon Web Services reInvent. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching this CUBE conversation from Palo Alto. <laughs>